Scream Queens review. This will have no spoilers. The show is from 2015, 2016. It is possible that there will be more seasons in the future, but so far only two seasons have come out, and it does not currently look like there will be a season three at least soon. So if you know, if at some point they do another season or multiple more seasons, if something in those seasons isn't covered in this video, in when I talk about the first two seasons, I will do more review videos. I'm gonna start by telling you this was a show that I absolutely loved, and I'm really gonna miss now that I'm done watching it. This video will have some jokes, I will get into some serious topics, and I realize this video is long, I'm going to do a can to make it worth your time. The top link in the description box will enable you to donate to the SAG After Strikers, and employ you to do so, and then there are some links to videos to help explain why this is such an important strike. So, this video is a review where I don't intend to spoil anything, I almost definitely won't spoil anything, if I decide partway through the video that I'm going to spoil, I verbally won't for you, so hold up an index finger while I'm spoiling so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. And if you want my spoiler-filled thoughts on episodes, the link to the playlist containing them will be in the description box. So this show is rated TV14, and... Yeah, so the IMDb Parents Guide says sex and nudity is mild, violence, of course, severe, profanity is moderate, alcohol, drugs, and smoking is mild, frightening and intense scene is moderate, and yeah, that all makes a lot of sense. It is a show that goes for being very offensive, so if that is not your thing, and, and I do mean beyond just, you know, the the... The, the horror stuff. It goes for a lot of offensive jokes. And yeah, the, the, the plot is this group of college students being terrorized by a serial killer. And let's see. Um, I think I will keep it at that and not give any more away. Now, this has a very strong pilot that really tells you what the show is going to be like, and also just, you know, the, the plot and character moments of the pilot really... Like you're gonna know very very quickly if you watch the if you watch just the first half of the pilot you're going to know if this is a show for you or not and the, the um and right and the the season two opener is also very strong and they also they do a good job of making the first season stand on its own uh, I would definitely say you get the sense that they weren't sure if they were going to get a second season the season one finale wraps up all the storylines of season one and season two introduces some new ones and yeah both season finales are also very very strong some of the best episodes you know, really delivering closure on the, the plot of the season. And just, yeah, like, it doesn't feel like any character was just forgotten or overlooked. They they give satisfying closure to their, their... They don't all have character arcs, but, like, what they were... What was going on for them in the season, there is some, you know, yeah, closure for that and that is remarkable because this show has a lot of characters you know part of the show is this like ah, what's the word a satire of slashers and yeah slasher movies do tend to have a lot of characters 
and yeah, um, I recommend you know pretty much pretty much all the the reviews that I read on Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes, and I'm uh, maybe not as much IMDb user reviews, but yeah, there were a lot of, of really great reviews. I don't know if I'm gonna be um, reading very many of them aloud. I'll, I'll see what I feel like. And the IMDb trivia is also great. And yeah, um, if you have a show where the first season is very focused, it can be really effective if the second season, or at least one of the follow-up seasons, really goes and toys with what is set up in the first season. Maybe characters that have power lose that power, or vice versa. Major character loses something that used to define them, has to come up with a new identity. A short list of shows that do this, not all of them, in season two. Prison Break, Dexter, Alias, various Star Trek shows, Burn Notice, Charmed, Two and a Half Men, Lost, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, and also this show. And yeah, it works very well. Um, I can understand, I've seen some people who were frustrated with the second season, and I can understand that, and I do definitely think... I don't know that I would say that it's lesser, because I think it has other strengths, but some of the strengths of the first season are not replicated in the second season, and honestly, there's no way they really could have. And, yeah, one thing I saw several people say was some stuff that replaces, you know, yeah, some of the stuff that was resolved in the end of season one, they have to replace it with something else in season two, because otherwise that would leave a massive gap in the show, and the things that they come up with feel like they they didn't quite have I don't I don't know if it's that they didn't have good ideas that were very distinct from season one, or if they were just worried that too many people would not watch season two if it didn't feel very similar. And that is, of course, that's that's a problem with a lot of sequels, whether we're talking later seasons of a TV show or movie sequels. And I think the show fares very well. I think they do a really good job, but I can appreciate there's definitely... I, I don't think that overall the season is worse. But if those were things that you really, really connected with in season one, you might just feel like season two just isn't quite for you. And again, you're going to know in like the season two opener pretty much if season two is for you. So the show uses electronic music really well. And it's clear that Ryan Murphy, the show creator, is progressive. A lot of the harshest jokes mock bigots, conservative ideas, selfishness, influential conservative figures in media, politics, and tech. But it definitely, I, I know a number of progressives that I personally respect that think that we shouldn't be making offensive jokes. And ultimately, in my opinion, it is a matter of opinion. You know, the, the show isn't saying that these things are okay to do in real life, but I 100%, I don't blame anyone who says that the show goes too far. And it definitely is trying to, to it's it's trying to push the, the line. And pretty much every episode has at least some voice over narration, by a major character, very noir. Basically, every major character is a suspect. They have a motive, and they will have at least one line or, like, shot, or, um, or they'll carry out some action that really makes you think they're the killer. All characters have at least some obnoxious trait or quirk that makes you remember them, makes it feel like what you're watching is set in the universe of slasher movies, many of which have mostly or only obnoxious characters. The show uses great needle drops, many from the 80s and 90s, great references to slashers, and let's see... Yeah, so slasher classics. Things will be filmed or set similar to it, and there's basically every single kind of bigotry on display, misogyny, ableism, racism, xenophobia. Each time it will be presented as a joke, either a character or the show itself is making a, a joke. The show does clearly acknowledge bigotry is wrong. 
sometimes characters will even explicitly call it out. And the show does also make fun of some left-leaning people and policies and such. And the, the show features a gradually uncovered mystery with clues and at least some progression each episode. A lot of the characters are more complex than they appear to be at first glance. Some characters are introduced as a one-note joke. And some of these are homophobic and ableist, but in interview, the actors who actually are disabled or gay will express that they appreciate the representation, they like the jokes, and though you know, for some there was like one or two jokes each that they objected to, and they were allowed to give input on the script. And something that I've seen some people take issue with, this show is definitely more comedy than horror, but there is still a good amount of horror. I would say it's maybe like 70, sometimes even 80% comedy, but the horror that there is is often so strong that, I, you know, I got into the show because I wanted to watch something horror. Before I started watching it, you know, I, I had heard the name Scream Queens. I was aware that there was some horror element to it. I didn't know that it was going to be so comedy driven. You know, I, I already watch other comedy stuff, but I was very happy with the, the, the horror in it. And it definitely is also like if you love horror, but you're not really into slasher movies, I'm not sure the show like it has some stuff for you, but it's it's maybe 5% of the show that's horror other than slasher. The most despicable characters are sometimes shown to have experienced something awful. That's why they themselves are terrible people. Some institutions that are clearly criticized are also, if not eventually called necessary evils, then certainly their appeal is made clear to the audience. As much as the show hates sororities, it does acknowledge they can provide a serious career boost. The show uses the satire defense and lampshading to get away with making some really offensive you know, Jimmy Carr style jokes, but also does examine the sources. I'd be lying if I claimed I didn't laugh at most of them. It references high school comedies as well as slashers. I would personally prefer if it was being written by a more diverse crew, but the jokes about deaf people, androgynous lesbians, etc., those characters are often played by people who actually are deaf or androgynous lesbians, and in interviews, you know, let's see, uh, I already mentioned that, and the, yeah, the show lets them be characters, sometimes as complex as the, the more, you know, the, yeah, the ones that aren't coded as other. They're not just there for us to laugh at, though that is part of it, as it is for every character that, you know, yeah, main, major, supporting, extras, but, but yeah, you know, they're not just there in the background for us to laugh at, as was often the case for a lot of 80s and 90s, you know, comedy, not just comedy movies and shows, but comedy bits about people who were other. And, you know, some members of minority groups do want Jimmy Carr-style jokes about them. It makes them feel included. Obviously, it's not the same for every single member of minority minorities and while the playing field is sadly not quite the same it is worth noting that the show makes harsh jokes about everyone not only minorities also straight white cis men a couple of those characters are the most ridiculous the ones we laugh the hardest at or find the most disgusting you know it's not saying that you should be straight white cis and male there's a lot of use of slang, and I'm pretty sure at least some of it, it was specifically made up for the show. I haven't heard it elsewhere, certainly. And each character is someone that you find yourself wanting to spend more time with. Some of them are fascinating. Others are so repugnant that you can't look away. And this is extremely unlike the vast majority of slash movies slasher movie characters, most of whom are simply too obnoxious for us to stand for very long, or just really boring. Let's see, and I appreciate that's, you know, I've heard at least one writer of 
at least one slasher movie, say it would be depressing to watch all these characters die if we like them, which, I mean, I guess I can understand the logic, but yikes. I mean, I, the, the implication is that we're supposed to be relieved when they do die, which, yeah, not really a, a fan of, of that. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the, as such, a lot of these slasher movie characters are made to be as unpleasant to, to watch as possible. And I think this show provides a very good counterpoint in saying you can make them obnoxious, but also interesting and compelling. All of the, sh the characters on this show are written and acted to perfection. They get exactly the response out of the audience that they're meant to. And as someone who's seen most of the major character actors and other things, I can say with certainty all of them are very capable of playing characters that are completely different from their characters in this. Characters on the show will choose sides, manipulate each other, different characters team team up Let's see and yeah we'll make different plans to maybe stop the killer or at least survive the killer and many major characters have goals that they hide from other characters maybe even from the audience and this is perhaps less a slasher thing than a, like a murder mystery kind of thing and yeah it also does really solid parody of that and, and satire not just parody the, the show will cross the line for you. It doesn't matter how much it takes to cross the line for you. Maybe it, you don't even have a line for it to cross. It will find a way to make the most offensive joke and likely get you to laugh at it. And I also appreciate many of the most awful characters on the show are well aware that they're awful and hated. Not every single episode has at least one really gnarly kill, but the ones that don't do tend to have at least, like, a dead body discovered in a creepy way. Each episode feels like its own slasher flick, with the setting, situation, or the like varying. One episode has Thanksgiving, another has a haunted house. And since the show is telling one ongoing story, it explains why these particular characters are now dealing with a haunted house and the like, and frequently ties into the investigation into who the serial killer is, the specific things that certain characters want to engage in to prevent that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, the show has a lot of flashbacks to help explain people's motivations and such, and apparently this is the show is very popular with segments of the lgbtqia plus community on account of the campiness of the show and i use the following word descriptively not derogatively the bitchiness of the chanels which i will explain shortly and that's awesome i'm really glad that they enjoy this too once again i'm not saying this is true of the entire community do not put that on all of them no, don't get mad if you meet an LGBTQI plus individual, and they say that they don't like the show. Obviously, they don't all agree on everything. The community is not a monolith. It would be extremely unfair to insist that they inspire all scientific achievements up to and including space travel and going all the way back to when we were mere actors wearing monkey costumes. Essentially, the show goes off the philosophy of comedy as the excellent stand-up comedian Jimmy Carr. If you make offensive jokes about everyone, you're offending and thus hurting no one. It's a form of equality, and again, I'm not saying everybody agrees with that. And it is definitely a show where young women deemed unattractive are killed off. It's not exclusively that. Other stuff happens, and not exclusively then. them. Some men, too. But they do definitely put a lot of work into making it happen so much. Some episodes will introduce a character that is conventionally unattractive in some way. They'll do a bunch of jokes about them, and they might not last past the episode. And, and others do last for a while. The show manages to fit in pretty much every major horror trope and story type and such. Like, there's some of the sci-fi based ones that it doesn't you know, fit in 
you know, and and they do, um, you know, they they f the focus is on the specific like serial killer more so than other ones, and the you know they don't do quite as many supernatural ones as ones with like rational explanations. In some episodes, the Abigail Breslin character is very much like a punching bag. Like, if something bad is going to happen, there's a pretty decent chance that it happens to her. It's usually very funny. And uh, since Kathy Munch and Chanel Oberlin despise each other, they usually do what they can to humiliate each other, which leads to a lot of the best jokes. For all the negative stereotypes, this is still a show with multiple black female characters who are very goal-oriented, and at least one of whom is very smart and left-leaning. The show does at times feel like it was made by the director of Space, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and such. I forget his name. Oh, it's Edgar, right? You never know exactly what you're going to get, and at any given moment... Except it likely won't be subtle, but it's either going to be a genre thrill or a joke of some sort. But the joke might be verbal, maybe it's a sight gag, maybe it's gross out. You know, there's a, a lot of different ones. Every so often, at least one character on the show will travel to a place invest to investigate, encountering at least one creepy person and or setting that may or may not be connected to the serial killer. Gotta have those red herrings. And the Chanel's are nearly always wearing pink and fur and other, like, hyper-feminine colors and types of clothes. And this manages to be both very tense and also hilarious. And the, you know, it is somewhat like with, with Jordan Peele and the directorial duo of Matt Bedinelli, Olpen, and Tyler Gillett, who, if you're not aware, the they directed Scream 5 and 6, as well as Ready or Not. And they've done a few other things that I'm not... I, I cannot really speak to. I hear, like, Devil's Do has a very low rating, so I don't... It's possible that one isn't good, but then... VH like Devil's Due is 4.2 on IMDb. VHS is 5.8, and I hear very good things about at least their segment, uh, 103198. But yeah, um, let's see, you know, it it is. These are, you know, these are creatives that understand that today it is necessary to subvert some of the horror tropes because otherwise we know what's coming. However, others have to be played straight, otherwise it becomes parody, which is not the desired outcome. Parts of this show are parody, but other parts are, like, yeah, played straight. And because some horror tropes are subverted and others are played straight, the viewer never knows which of these to expect. And the laughs release the tension built without having to resolve the source of tension. It's like, you know, there, there's, you know, build up to, oh, there's there's something really dangerous here, there's something really dangerous there. Oh, is it going to be, and then, oh, no, that's actually kind of funny, I didn't see that coming. But there's still danger, you know, it's just very, very nicely done. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the show creators are Ian Brennan, Brad Falchuk, and Ryan Murphy. And Ryan Murphy, you know, other than this, he's known for Glee and American Horror Story, for, you know, for which he is producer and showrunner. And I have not watched, I am planning on watching American Horror Story. I'm not st currently planning on Glee. Um, it just, I don't have any problem with it. I, th I think it's great that fiction is being made that, like, I, I forget who said it, but I saw someone describe Glee as, like, the the dream of theater kids. And I'm really glad that that's, you know, 
yeah, I, I, you know, I am not a theater kid, but I am really glad that there are shows that are, you know, they're specifically for them because there's so much media that makes fun of them, that makes it out as, you know, oh, they're, you know, yeah, I don't think I want to get into, but there's a lot of negative stereotypes about them. But, but yeah, um, if you have watched Glee, from what I understand, there's a lot of overlap between comedy, as there is between at least some of the, the cast. Uh, Leia Michelle is in both shows, for example. And some of the, the characters in this show, uh, uh, some of the actors in this show actually also appear in American Horror Story, and if I understand correctly, Emma Roberts actually got the role for this show based on a role she played on American Horror Story, and yeah, that's that's very, very cool. And yeah, so the, yeah, perhaps the lead, arguably the lead, is Emma Roberts as Chanel Oberlin. She's very deeply emotionally engaged, okay? You might not understand the kind of frustrations that she feels, but the fact that she always looks amazing doesn't mean that she doesn't have problems, okay? In fact, she probably has bigger problems than you do, and you're frankly being incredibly selfish in not understanding and appreciating that. She's she's such a fun character. Just, like, I've been a fan of Emma Roberts for a while now. She knocked it out the park in Screen 4, and just, yeah, um... You know, I there's a lot of things she's done that I haven't seen. They they just don't completely seem like my kind of thing. But I'm always happy to see her pop up in in something. You know, and Julia Roberts is her aunt, and both of them have the the sort of you know very very conventionally attractive like Hollywood beauty kind of thing. But Emma you know, daughter of Eric Roberts. Also, like, her face just works really well for her playing these really obnoxious characters, and it's the kind of thing that she could either feel super self-conscious about, or she could really lean into, and yeah, in at least some of her roles, she 100%, she really leans into how she can just, yeah, you know, she does that here. I hear she does it in American Horror Story. She does it in Scream 4. Uh, yeah, you know, just really, really glad that she has embraced the, the yeah. And Skylar Samuels plays Grace Gardner. She is, you know, she can be kind of goody two-shoes, so I really appreciate that she does also have personality. She's not just like constantly, you know, she's not boring as a character, which very easily could be the case. And she is basically supposed to be like the, the, I'm not going to reveal whether or not it turns out that way, but you get the sense, oh, this is the final girl. You know, she's the one who's going to be so virtuous that no one will, you know, she's never gonna smoke weed or have premarital sex or drink or party, you know, she's she's so good that none of that, you know, yeah. And it wouldn't be a slasher satire if you didn't have at least one character like that. And the big thing there is you gotta make sure the character isn't boring the the final girl in a lot of slashers some of the better slashers make sure that she's not boring you know but there are definitely some where yeah she ends up being fairly boring you know a lot of slashers have this very old testament idea where you know if you sin you know as if sin is a real thing rather than you know snake oil salesman bs if you sin, you will die brutally. You know, so the final girl never sins. And that by itself doesn't necessarily make a character boring, 
but just, yeah, you know, they're, they're often the character who's written to not be obnoxious so that the audience won't hate spending so much time with them. And, yeah, they, they do a really great job. And I have to admit, like, Skylar Samuels, I don't really know from anything else. You know, I've, I've heard of the things that... Yeah, yeah, she was in she was in Meg Two, for example, just recently, which I haven't watched. She was in the Stepfather remake. You know, just yeah, she's she's been in stuff, right? And and yeah, um, I actually forgot about that, but yeah, she was on like Disney, sh you know, shows. She was on The Wizards of Waverly Place you know, as a teenager, that's another thing that, you know, so was Emma Roberts. Um, yeah, I'd like to see her in, in more stuff. But, but yeah, she absolutely nails it. Uh, you know, she just really wants to connect with her long-dead mother, feels that the best way to do that is to join the same sorority her mother was in. She wants to change the sorority for the better, realizing all the, the horrible things that it, it does. And yeah, Leia Michelle plays Hester Ulrich. She can be very intense and intimidating because you know what? She understands. She gets you, okay? And just she she just nails this thing of like she'll say several things in a row where you're like, you know what? Maybe, maybe I was a little too harsh. Maybe maybe she is a completely normal, well-adjusted young woman, and then she'll say one thing that is like, okay, never mind, I was 100%, everyone's right in judging you, because that is not okay to say or do or the like. And Glenn Powell plays Chad Radwell. He realizes that not everybody is a psych major like he is. So, you know what? Maybe this is too difficult for some people to understand, but, like, he really needs his freedom, okay? If you try to ask him for monogamy, that is just so manipulative. Like, it's so controlling, and honestly, it is a completely unacceptable request. And, you know, Glenn Powell has long acknowledged that his face and voice are, under certain circumstances, imminently punchable. So he's played douches before, like in The Dark Knight Rises, where he works on Wall Street, Bain has a great line about he and the others are there to steal money, you know, and other times he plays just, you know, the, the nice guy, the, the one that, you know, your mom hopes you bring home if you're a young woman or if you're a gay guy and she's very, you know, non-judgmental about it. But just, I, I'm really, really glad that he has fully embraced, again, it's this thing of like, you could understand if he were self-conscious about that, and if he was like, no, I don't want to take roles like that, but, you know, it's it's like with with Chris Evans, you know, every so often, you know, some they'll do some roles where they're just, oh, what a, what a lovely young man, you know, and then they'll do roles where it's just, oh, this guy, oh, please shut up, you know, and, yeah, I really appreciate that they've embraced that that's, something that that very much comes across if you just look you know and yeah just he's he's so much fun he's he's probably the most fun male character uh, on the show but then there is of course also Diego Bonetta as Pete Martinez a dogged investigator who busts out his McConaughey accent much more eagerly than is particularly beneficial to the situation in which he finds himself. And honestly, who can blame him? It's just so much fun. And yeah, Abigail Breslin plays Libby Putney, also known as Chanel number five. She finds that Chanel Oberlin is incredibly disrespectful, and you get the sense that she thinks it is not acceptable. And this sense comes mostly from the fact that she keeps saying it over and over and over. And something I appreciate, like, after a while, they, they make her character, like, really, really happy when she senses this is good news, which is, you know, that's nice. 
but she's not good at telling if something is good news or not. So she'll be like, oh, that's amazing for you. And the other person is like, what are you talking about? This is the worst thing ever. You know, and just, yeah, very, very fun. And I think this is a good time to, to say Chanel Oberlin often goes by Chanel number one. And she has chosen that she is going to basically make the other sorority sisters her clones. So she insists that they go by Chanel number two, three, four, and five. And yeah. And Kiki Palmer as plays Zayday Williams, and she has intentions to become the first female black president of the sorority, I mean. And, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really glad that Kiki Palmer, you know, I don't know her from very much, but the, the, she's amazing here, she's amazing in Nope, I gotta see her in more stuff, you know, and, yeah, it, it is this thing of the, the, Oh, that's right. She was on the the Scream TV show itself as well. Yeah, just she she really has a sense of like comedy horror, you know, the the tone and the balance. Oliver Hudson plays Weston Wes Gardner. His dedication to protecting his daughter it doesn't, like, I know some people would say it, like, enters into creepy territory, which is just a completely absurd statement. He has set up permanent resonance there. It is, it is wild how far he'll go to, to protect Grace. Nassim Pedrad plays Gigi Caldwell, and she used to be a member of the sorority, uh, Kappa Kappa Tau. She's now a lawyer for it, and yeah, they get a lot of fun stuff out of the fact that, yeah, you know, the, the show doesn't have a huge amount of major characters who are, like, former members of the, the sorority. Most of the sorority members are college-aged. And Lucian Lave Count plays Earl Grey. And yeah, very, very fun character. I don't have a lot to, to say. Just, yeah, he's, he's also in a fraternity like Chad Radwell. And with Billy Lord plays Sadie Swenson or Chanel number no. three. She might come across as kind of disinterested, seeming like she doesn't really care in the slightest about anything that's going on around her, but whatever. She's here. She'll take part. I guess. She is hilariously gullible. gullible. No matter how ridiculous something is, there's a decent chance that she will believe it hook, line, and sinker with no evidence at all. And when someone else points out that's ridiculous. There's no way that's true. She'll be completely stuck. She, she won't be like, yeah, honestly, yeah, you know what? That doesn't make sense. She'll be like, oh, but what if it is, though? And just fantastic. Like, Billy Lord, um, you know, daughter of Carrie Fisher, I only know her from this and then the the Star Wars sequel trilogy you know which I, I don't blame her if you don't remember she plays Lieutenant Connix is that name ever even said on screen I'm, I'm not entirely sure but yeah you know she's there if you know what she looks like you'll you'll recognize her in in the film you know um, she's in part, you know, I don't want to say like, oh, Nepo baby. I th I do think that she is, you know, at at least partially there as like a tribute to 
Carrie Fisher, who herself, of course, you know, R.I.P. by then could not do the kind of action scenes that were expected from major characters in, you know, action movies made today. And, and you know, she does also play Leia for a brief flashback in which her face was digitally replaced by Fisher's likeness. But, yeah, um, she's a much... In, in Star Wars, and especially in Interview, she is much more like... More, yeah, more more like alive than, you know, her, her character in this is specifically supposed to, you know, she's like the girl who's just too cool for everyone kind of thing in this show. And she just absolutely nails it. And Jamie Lee Curtis, the icon, the legend, cast, of course, in part because she was, you know, she played a very important role in the 1978 Halloween, the proto-slasher. Some call it the original slasher. I see it as the, the proto-slasher. It sets up stuff, but it doesn't go as far as slashers in the 80s would come to. She plays Dean Kathy Munch. She hates the sorority, and Chanel Oberlin in particular, personally, and does what she can to take both of them down. There's a lot of very heavy competition. I think this might be my single favorite role for Jamie Lee Curtis. And really, it's it's one of those, like, she's one of those actresses, she's been amazing for, not an exaggeration, literally over 40 years by now. And a lot of her best work is actually very recent. You know, there's this, there's the newer Halloween trilogy, the H40 trilogy, and everything everywhere all at once. You know, she does fantastic. You know, I, I know some people think, oh, you know, talent fades with age. Maybe for some, but not for Jamie Lee Curtis. And the fact that she plays, like, you can understand why she hates the the sorority and Chanel, but she's legitimately like an unpleasant, like, yeah, we're encouraged to think that she goes way too far, and she absolutely nails it. You know, she's another one of those actresses, like, under the right circumstances, she can play just despicable characters. Kirstie Alley plays... Ingrid Hoffel, and she's also phenomenal. I'm really glad that, you know, not, not all of her, you know, Kirstie Alley, R.I.P., not all of her last work was quite as beloved and, and quite up to the, you know, like, you know, she she's good in Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan, you know, she's she's really, really good in the Look Who's Talking trilogy. Drop Dead Gorgeous, fantastic, you know, but then, like, some of, you know, she... I don't think Village of the Damned from 1995, the, the remake, is her fault. But it definitely, you know, it's not a good movie and she's not that great in it. Uh, you know, which, you know, I don't think anybody is just, like that great in in that including other really talented actors but yeah the the fact you know in in this show she helped to really show that she still had it taylor lautner plays cassidy cascade i realize that lautner is not considered a great actor i don't know if he's good at giving a natural performance but here he's more of this like deadpan to the often very hammy OTT performances by many other cast members and for that he acquits himself very nicely but yeah I do acknowledge you know we all admit that he was not like amazing in you know 
something he did some some years ago. You know the the. I think it's important to to keep in mind that the movie that some of us think of when we hear the name Taylor Lautner. You know. I don't know if it had a huge chance of being just, like, amazing, you know, a lot of people have already pointed out the effects, uh, and, you know, the, the lead character can be kind of, kind of bland, and you kind of wish that there was someone more, you know, but, it's, yeah, but enough about the adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Oh, right, and I, he did, like, Twilight, I think? I haven't watched those movies. Seriously, though, I'd like to think that if I tried watching Twilight, which I'm not, like, opposed to, I just, I don't really, I don't hugely feel like it. I'd like to think that I would come down on the, like, I would, I would feel the way that Lindsay Ellis did when making the... I'm gonna make sure I get the title right. I believe it is called. Oh, uh, I could have sworn. Um, Dear Stephanie Meyer, you know where she points out that the the criticism of Twilight was blown out of proportion and she goes over through she goes over some of the reasons for that James Earl the third plays Jackson and he's a very fun character like he just he just wants to cheer people up you know John Stamos plays a character of Brock Holt and John Stamos is one of those people, again, that I've, I've heard people say he can't act. He just got very lucky that, you know, Full House did well and, you know, it left a lot of people with a very positive impression of him. You know, the, the younger audiences think he's cool. Everybody thinks he's very sweet and, and caring. The adults think... Why does he live with his family? Why doesn't he have his own place? But, you know, yeah, he's he's appealing, he's charming. And yeah, just the the Oh, that's right. He was on General Hospital. Huh. I don't know if he can do like a really like great natural acting performance but here he plays this character that like most of the characters on the show there's this sort of sinister side to him but they really use the fact that he is you know he is charming and you know he was like what 60 when let's see if... I guess 50, yeah, in, in his early 50s. He's 60 now. In his early 50s when he appeared on this show, and they talk about him like, oh, he's he must be 60. He looks, you know, but they talk about, you know, oh, he still looks amazing. And just the the fact, this, this interplay that, like, you have women fawning over him and he flashes the great smile and never shuts up about going to Harvard, but then every so often he'll say or do something, and, and there's like, he really nails this sinister look on his face. And they just, I, I'm, you know, he must have spent forever practicing that in the mirror, because he absolutely nails it. And it's wild to me that he can do that after playing, you know, Jesse on, uh, Uncle Jesse on Full House, you know, which, yes, I, I was the right age when that show first aired, so I did watch it when it was first on, and, yeah, it just, you know, he he's so great. 
And then we have Nisi Nash as Denise Hemphill, and she has theories, let me tell you. She is certain about who is the killer. And it is it is very, very fun to to watch her try to yeah. She is basically like a, a security guard kind of you know, and yeah, just very, very fun character. And um, Riley Schmidt plays the, you know, he's, he's in costume. It's a costumed killer. And, yeah, he, he does really phenomenal as the, the, the killer has a very strong physical pres presence. And, yeah, he also appeared in some of American Horror Story after the oh act, oh yeah both before and after this actually i see now um and the days of our lives and power rangers time force sabrina the teenage witch yeah you know he he really delivers this is the kind of thing where you have to have a strong physical presence for the killer or it just doesn't work. You know, that is one thing, you know, even people who hate the Friday the 13th movies, and I don't really blame them. I don't think any of those movies quite qualify as good movies, but they are all fun. I can sit down and watch any of them. Yes, even the remake. And, and have a good time, you know, but something that I don't, I've never met anyone who made a serious case that the killer does not have a strong physical presence in those movies. Ariana Grande plays Sonia Herfman, or Chanel number no. two. I didn't think that I would be saying you know when when people talk about Ariana Grande usually you know they'll they'll say oh you know she can sing not everybody's into her music but she can definitely sing but a lot of people don't think very highly of her acting uh, you know which is uh, you know she she started on like yeah like disney you know it's a lot of people don't think very highly of those shows um I, there was a very recent upload, um, what was, ah, I, I'm struggling to remember the, the name right now, but there was this, there, there was an, an upload by, um, wow, I can't believe it, I, I just, um, ADHD acting up, what is, what is her channel name again, um, Ah, crap. I'm, I'll, I'll think of it later, but she made the point that a lot of people don't think very highly of the, the, the shows and the people who act in them, even though some of them have shown elsewhere. You know, some of them were on Broadway, and actually, I see now, yeah, Grande was on, on Broadway as well. You know, the, the... Yeah, you know, there, there's a lot of people who don't, like, you kind of expect kind of cheesy, lame, overdone performances on Disney shows for, for kids and teenagers. You know, that doesn't mean that they don't have talent. But, yeah, she actually, she does very well on this show. And Nick Jonas plays Boone Clemens. And that's another, you know, Nick Jonas, um, yeah, Disney, and one of the Jonas Brothers, who a lot of people hate seemingly primarily because a lot of, like, teenage girls really love the group. Like, I'm not going to claim that there's, like, nothing, like, the, the I want to say, wasn't he one of the, yeah, he, he was one of the, the purity ring people but I mean that was like 
the the um, he you know he was working for Disney. Disney demanded that of of you know several of the the people who went. so so yeah, um, but but yeah, he is phenomenal. He's he's so much fun. I don't want to give too much away about his character. Just it is a common fact, commonly known fact on this show that he is gay and they never shut up about it like every single like they're always calling him gay boon and like there's one point where like someone matching the description of of boon has been seen you know and th there's like a radio broadcast about you know we believe this may be gay boon and it's like why are you even you know Everyone's obsessed about it, and he's, yeah, just very, very fun, and, yeah. Let's see, and they, they, you know, they mock gay panic through his character. Breezy Eslin plays Jennifer. She came here to eat candles and add quirkiness, and she never runs out of candles. Jana Han plays Sam. She is the androgynous uh, lesbian and yeah like she absolutely nails the the performance Aaron Rhodes plays Roger Austin Rhodes plays Dodger and yes they are indeed twins and I don't want to give too much away I'll just say that they yeah they make some jokes about weirdness between twins and I think that might be more or less yeah I think that is right right um Jerry O'Connell plays a character named Mike and he's he's great and it's you know He's he's usually fun to see in in stuff. Charisma Carpenter appears, uh, and they they have some fun with like the the image that she used to have. Chad Michael Murray shows up, and you know I liked him fine on One Tree Hill and in. Uh, House of Wax, the the remake, obviously. Uh, you know he was phenomenal on this show, and so was Alan Thicke, Patrick Schwarzenegger. You know, others have said he's not like quite. He does not have his father's charisma. Uh, you know, obviously. Arnold Schwarzenegger. I've heard he was okay at best in other stuff. Here, he really is phenomenal. And, you know, I, I don't know if this is one of the shows where they, like, straight up had, like, an acting coach or a, a acting camp kind of thing, but everyone seems to get it. Like, nobody on this show seems to have not understood the tone they're going for. And they seem to legitimately only have cast people who really could nail that. Like, I, I am not going to lie. When I saw that Taylor Lautner was going to be in this, like, I, I don't... Other than for this show, I don't think I've heard people say anything positive about you know his his acting in in pretty much anything you know it's it's one of those things where like you know some people really loved him in in twilight and then you know after that he got some roles in other stuff you know they were trying to, to capitalize on that but you know he was given roles where he could have shown off and this is to my understanding i haven't watched them myself 
where he could have shown off talent, but he, you know, he he just didn't. And you know, that's not always, you know, sometimes people have the ability, but they don't completely connect with a role, or you know, things can happen. But the the ah, what's the word? I, I haven't heard of him like really nailing a role other than this one. I, I was a little concerned about this, but I loved him from the moment he appeared. The the dialogue is without exception incredibly well written and delivered. And the cinematography and editing are incredible like they really do what's the word they this is one of those TV shows that isn't that doesn't feel like just a TV show you know it feels more like a long movie that's split into episodes the the cinematography and editing are as good as like yeah, you know, it, it does not feel like, oh, we gotta shoot X amount of episodes and X amount of time, we gotta just shoot it in a, in a, you know, in an effective way that isn't necessarily the most, like, this has cinematic filming and editing. And the cinematography was handled by Joaquin Cedillo and Michael Goy, and the editing was handled by John Petaja, Andrew Groves, Ishai Seton, Sean Aylward, Francis Muller, and Adam Penn, and yeah, just phenomenal work. The like you can really feel that this was very heavily inspired by like slasher movies, and the music was handled by Mac Quayle, and yeah, just fantastic. Let's see, um, yeah, so a so, uh, quote from a critic. The score of this series is incredible. Electro sound, there's a perfect little piece with a minimalistic sound that's sort of creepy horror-like music, and at the same time it has the EDM excitement about it in a subtle way. And, yeah, and, and horror is accomplished through, you know, I, I mentioned you know, some gnarly, you know, deaths where, like, you can practically feel, oh, that's gotta really hurt, but you also have just, like, atmosphere. You have, you know, someone will walk down a dimly lit hallway and the camera will be tilted and you'll hear a, a creepy noise off in the, the distance, you know, and then you have, like, you know, as it is a slasher, you have scenes of people being, like, directly stalked or even hunted by the the serial killer the sound design is incredible like every step of the way it really absolutely nails you know the the sounds that help sell the the area and situation for for the atmosphere the the sounds when someone is killed in a really brutal graphic way and and also like for you know comedy stuff there's some really excellent sound editing uh, you know exaggerated screams to the point where it's not like ah oh, it's scary it's like yeah that's ridiculous and you know they'll there's slow mo on some noises that makes them end up comical the the pacing is quite good i already mentioned the 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 mystery will gradually be uncovered and also just like you get a sense like several there are characters on this show like yeah they're they're upset about the whole serial killing thing but i mean they have other thing they have a life you know they have other things they want to try to accomplish and yeah they pursue that and it can sometimes be very much this thing of like well if this wasn't about serial killing the the thing that's happening here is almost kind of sweet 
but because there is a serial killer, it's like, what is wrong with these people kind of thing? And just, yeah, absolutely nails that. You know, there, there are scenes, there, there are certain episodes of the show where, like, two characters will be going through relationship drama, and it's sometimes very realistic, like, does this, does my partner respect my boundaries? You know, do I, do we have enough in common? Do we have a future? These kinds of things that are actual relationship issues in real life. But, by the way, there's a serial killer, and, you know, the reason that the boundaries may not be getting respected is because of a serial killer, you know, just, so, yeah. So, the the best elements of this show, the, the mix of humor and horror, the performances, the tone, and how consistent it is, the cinematic feel... The worst aspect is probably that there may be hateful people quoting it to, to bully people. Uh, something I saw various people call out was, as, as the worst thing, some people thought there was too much gross-out humor, and, you know, when I, when I first wrote, read that someone put in their review, you know, the, the, this show has so many poop jokes that we should never again make a poop joke. We've we've exhausted the, the supply. You know, at first I was like, really? Is that that sounds kind of you know, I mean, I'm I'm a lot of my favorite comedies don't really have gross out humor. It's not something I'm I'm okay with it. You know, I think if you do it well. But then I watched the show, and it's like, okay, yeah, this is a lot. Now, the thing I was most worried about before I started watching was that it would only either be funny or scary, but not both. You know, I've seen things that are trying to, like, satirize something, and, like, ultimately they're not, you know. I very recently did Starship Troopers. That movie does work as an action movie. There's enough action, it gets big enough, it gets dramatic enough. But, you know, there are some satires where it just doesn't completely work. They didn't completely nail, you know, which sometimes that's fine. Sometimes it works well that it absolutely does not work as the thing it's satirizing. But, yeah, you know, yeah, I was a little concerned, but... The, the show absolutely exceeded my expectations. And the thing I was most looking forward to was Jamie Lee Curtis in another horror-related thing and the rest of the cast. You know, yeah. And they all exceeded my expectations. This is, yeah. And I've already mentioned that the season openers and finales are great. The, the episodes as well, all of them great. I love every single episode of the show. You know, there isn't a single, like, hypothetically, let's say that, like, I wrote every episode title on, like, a, a piece of paper, put them all in a, in a bowl, picked one at random. I would be ecstatic to watch that episode again. I wouldn't be like, ah, that episode, though, I don't know, you know. And that's not easy to accomplish. Now, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 77% average and a 75% average for audiences. The first season has a 68% from critics and a 79% from audiences. And yeah, the, the consensus was that it was too tasteless for mainstream viewers, too silly for horror enthusiasts. Scream Queens fails to satisfy, and I can understand where they're coming. I would definitely say it is too tasteless for mainstream viewers. And I get there's a lot of horror enthusiasts who would not. Um, I think this is somewhat like, you know... Is that... Yeah, the the it's it's somewhat like with the the Evil Dead movies. You know, you can 
which, yeah, at this point I might as well, you know, reveal. I intend to be, I intend to, you know, I already did a video on the, the most recent one, Evil Dead Rise, when it hit theaters. I have copies of the first, uh, you know, yeah, the, the trilogy as well as the remake, and those are the four movies I intend to do this month. Spooktober. Yeah, the, the, it's very much that sort of thing, you know, you see some people saying it definitely, you know, yeah, some, some people love the, the horror, some people love the, the, the comedy, not everybody loves both, and if you don't love both, it definitely can feel like it's it's not gonna gonna hit for you completely. Yeah. Um, and yeah, season two. Yeah, season two had an eighty-six percent. On Rotten Tomatoes and 71% from audience score. So higher for critics, lower for audiences. The only, but there's only, there's also only seven critic reviews counted. So only one of them is is rotten, and that's why you know if there were more reviews, it might be a lower overall score. And the yeah, the first, the the one rotten one says. Season 1 had its toes dipped in reality for the most part. Season 2's first episode rarely flirted with the real world. And that's something I can understand why that bothers some people. I loved it. And on Metacritic... Uh, okay. That's a thing. I Okay, I'm going to see if it really can't. I left a link, and usually that works, but, huh, has it just straight up been removed? Is that it? I guess it's just not on Metacritic anymore. Uh, let's see, did I, by chance, copy in, because sometimes, yes. So the the for critics it was a 59 out of 100 uh, based on 33 critic reviews which is mixed or average uh, 13 positive 16 mixed 4 negative and for users it was a 7.0 out of 10 seven, based on 17 rating you know general favorable reviews based on 17 ratings 12 positive, 2 mixed, 3 negative, and let's see, so yeah, there's one negative review here, and okay, so they claim the show has crappy writing and boring cliffhangers, yeah, to, to each their own, I completely disagree, and uh, yeah, there's, um, the rest of the reviews are largely Extremely, yeah, m most people, there, there's not a lot of reviews, but most of the reviews gave it 10 out of 10. Uh, th yeah, one, one says, Chanel's lines are hilarious. I love the dark humor in it. Another says, Emma Roberts' acting is on point. Uh, right, there's, oh, actually, yeah, that was a 7 out of 10 review. But, but yeah, um... And on IMDb, there, yeah, it has a 7.1 out of 10 based on 45,000 reviews. And I do think that points to that a lot of the people who went and rated it, it just wasn't their kind of thing. I, I think for most of those of us who it really is our kind of thing, you know, like... I don't think that we're being like overly generous with it. I think it is that it just it absolutely nails, and it's very difficult to to get exactly right. So, yeah, but you know, some people choose to rate something negative that just wasn't made for them, and you know, I prefer when they don't. But yeah. 
I, I think this deserves more like an 8, maybe 8.5 or something for how well made it is. I, I wish IMDb had a thing where instead of rating, it could just be like this percentage of people, this, you know, so many thousands of people said, this wasn't my kind of thing, you know, and maybe even add like, this is what I wanted it to be. So that people could be like, oh, I wanted it to be this, I guess it's not for me. And move on, you know, instead of, anyway. But yeah, 20.5% um, gave it 10. Another 20.5 gave it 7. 20.4 gave it 8. 11.2 gave it 9. 10.6 gave it 6. 5.5 gave 5. 4.4 gave it 1. Which is just absurd to me. I don't know how anyone could give this a 1, but I've already addressed that. 3.0 gave it 4. 2.2 .2 gave it 3. 1.7 gave it two. Like, I could maybe understand a five, um, but yeah, anything lower than that doesn't really make sense to me. There are 153 user reviews, or 122 if you hide spoilers. I read the top uh, voted 100%. Nine of those reviews gave it a one. 3 gave it a 2, 4 gave it a 3, 1 gave it a 4, 6 gave it a 5, 2 gave it a 6, 9 gave it a 7, 15 gave it an 8, 17 gave it a 9, and 34 gave it a 10. So most of, you know, the, yeah, the majority of the people who found the show and really loved it, you know, yeah, yeah. So the, right. The special effects are quite impressive. There are times where they just do, like, CG, but they went practical whenever it wasn't impractical to do so. And I really, you know, greatly appreciate. I'm not going to give away anything that will, like, spoil something, but, you know, there's... If, yeah, if someone gets, like, physically really messed up, which happens with a lot of the kills. If they can, they will show it with practical effects. You know, sometimes we see the kill carried out, sometimes we see someone find the body and it's in a horrible state. But, yeah, they really, you know, it's very clear that they don't like, they share my dislike of using CG in horror when it's possible to use practical effects. Uh, you know, we had a problem with horror movies overusing CG in the 90s. Uh, you know, it wasn't the only genre, but it was very badly hit, and there was a lot of movies where it was like, because they had this tool that allowed them to do anything they wanted, they stopped paying attention to things like atmosphere and like just it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to feel like it's in the real world if that's the tone you're going for if if you're fine with your movie not feeling like it belongs in the real world it, it's taking place in the real world i don't think that movies have to do that i think some movies are better if they try to be set in the real world, but a lot of movies should not be, you know, trying to, to take place in the real world. But the moment that you have just the ability to do anything you want with, with for example, CG, you really have to, to take a step back and think, you know, is this actually better? Or is it just, you know, like... We all enjoy playing, but not all play leads to good movies. Just get it out of your system. You know, there's a lot of movies that have a lot of effects where, like, if they have a, you know, if, yeah, if you get the DVD, maybe there's, like, you know, maybe it's part of the blooper reel, maybe it's separate, but they'll have, like, a thing where, oh, look, we made the CG character dance, you know, or, or, you know, do something goofy looking. Put it there. Don't put it in the movie. Don't, you know, don't, not, not CG dancing, but like something that doesn't make the movie better. You know, CG, like any tool, there's an appropriate place to use it, an appropriate way to use it. 
but yeah, there's some there's some really really great. Let's see, yeah. So not a, not a spoiler, but there's one point where they like find a body, and someone makes the decision to like try to poke the body, and because the body has been dead for a little while, their finger like just just goes right through the skin and into the flesh. And it's just so nasty, and I love it. There's, you know, yeah, people are stabbed, limbs are cut off, you know, blood will pump out of a, a wound, and and this kind of thing, and just yeah, a lot of a lot of really great, you know, and and they try to get creative, and and a number of the kills are very specific to the person, like. You know, oh, so in life you liked this particular thing? Well, in death, I'm going to pose you in this really morbid pose. And, you know, there's going to be a bunch of the thing that you liked, that, that you know, was your great passion when you were alive, is going to be, you know, pose. Just fantastic, which, you know, that's also a slasher thing. You know, someone being killed in a, you know, yeah, being killed with a weapon that they were like toying around with, for example, or they say, Oof, when I grow up, I'm going to be this, and then they get killed by a thing that would have been part of their career, or something like that. There's some really excellent stunt work, which is, of course, quite necessary when you're having like this sort of slasher thing of like people hunt, like, yeah, a killer hunting people and them running away, and maybe like, maybe they fight back against the killer some, and yeah. So, yeah, um, this is, I, I try to, to be very, like, brutally honest when I give a, a rating of something, because I feel like if you give, you know, everything you like, a 10 out of 10, it stops being, like, impressive, and at some point it's just like, oh, Yes, that reviewer really liked that thing. But I do also feel like if we never give tens, you know, then it stops being like if you know there there are certain reviewers I've never seen them give like a perfect score, and I I think they mean it to say that they've never encountered something they would call perfect, and I do appreciate. I think perfection is something we can never reach but must never stop trying to reach achieve but then some things yeah like at the end of the day i can't point to something in this show that i legitimately like there's a couple of things where you know i've i've mentioned i some of the offensive things i don't love that they did them but they were incredibly funny. You know, that is what the show is, is going for. Yeah. Um, I rate this 10 slasher satires out of 10. And... Yeah, so... Um, it's not that the show is, like, extremely old. You know, it ran 7 to 8 years ago. But even so, it does really hold up. It, it is the kind of thing, if you're watching it today, there's a couple of really, really topical references that, I, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, they aged poorly. I don't agree with that assessment of it. But it is something where if you don't remember that that was a thing at that time, it might take you a second to remember that thing, and the joke might not land quite as well. But, you know, it aired when it did. So, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to go for really topical jokes. And, yeah, I, th I, I think this is the kind of thing that, you know, it is now on Disney+. Plus. You know, if you have access to Disney+, Plus and it's not, you know, age gate, you know, if, if, you, if you have an a account on Disney+, Plus that, you know, is accessible... To, to children, you know, you can put, yeah, you can, you can set a specific age lock, age gate for it, 
and this kind of thing will be behind that. I hope that even more people sit down and watch. You know, I mentioned like it's not that's not that many user reviews on IMDb for something so recent and that clearly, you know, thousands of tens of thousands of people really love. You know, I th I think it might be like it 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 might still be discovered by people who haven't discovered it yet and you know it clearly has already found a sizable audience but I think there are a lot of people out there who could love this who haven't watched it yet and let's see yeah that is it for the review so let me know uh, if you watched the show what was your favorite episode or character uh, what is your favorite slasher movie? What would you like to see if they do make a third season? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, one talking about my spoilerful thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus Star Wars show, which these days is Ahsoka. I also do a weekly video where I talk about the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of a horror show until recently, and this week included. It was this show, but starting next week, it will be the show Blood Curse which is also known as Teludara. And right, and, and starting next week, the you know, I'm, I want to continue doing a weekly thing of Star Wars, uh, you know, so I'm going to start doing you know, one week I'll do an episode of Droids, the yeah, Star Wars Vintage Show. Next, you know, the week after that, I'll do an episode of the other Star Wars Vintage Show, Ewoks. Week after that will be Droids again. Week after that will be Ewoks again. Until I'm done with those two shows. I try to every day, but I don't act, I don't quite manage to every single day do watch and do a vlog on the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of a Marvel show, which right now is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, let's see, today will probably be Season 2, Episode 3 of that. And recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in a separate video, since its running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if more videos like this, you're in luck. You could check out my back cow, as we'll catch next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording.